four months later when it all catches up to him and I'm gone and I've got my half a million dollars in cash, he's got some major problems. <laughs> but the truth is, what have I done? Even if he picked me out of a lineup, he gave me all cash. I'd be like, I don't know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Cox. I'm here with John Boziak, and we are checking out and talking about modern scams. This video is sponsored by Exter. They make these really cool wallets, and they've got actually a bunch of products. If you're interested, you definitely should go to their website, and we've got the link in the description box. Also, you get 20% off if you click on the link and buy anything. Really, really stylish. Uh, I like, listen, honestly, we were talking about it earlier. We, I like the box that it comes in. It's got a whole Apple Watch feel. Um, yeah, definitely got to check it out. And uh, you have to go in the description box. You got to go. They got little videos of the products and everything. They're super cool. And check them out. So appreciate it. Sublime, bud. If you guys started your hustle today, how do you think you would do? With technology always changing, I'm sure it was a full-time job in itself trying to stay ahead of the curve. Also, in your day-to-day -day life, how stressful was your day? Did a sight of a cop car while driving make your stomach drop? See, that's a good question, right? Like, he thought his question out. Yeah. Well, what, what's, what's yours? Because credit uh, cards is... Well, I mean, you know, there's always going to be some kind of version of credit card fraud going on. Now, whether there's, you know, people hacking the numbers or using the cards online or actually printing cards and using them in the store, it's it's always going to, it's right. always going to exist, um, you know. But I think today uh, it's it's a lot more, it's, it's a little bit more difficult um, to do credit card fraud, especially in store now, because, you know, like I said, 15 years ago when I was doing it, uh, 15, 20 years ago, it was, you know, nobody really knew what was going on. You know, and now obviously because of all of the bad press, bad press, because all of the, the negative press uh, credit card fraud's getting nowadays. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's just it's just more widely known. So there, you know, there's whole entire teams have been put together to kind of combat these things. So it'd be more difficult, but you know, where there's a will, there's if there's a will, there's a way. And I'm just, you know, these guys every time the authorities and the banks and the and the and the big box stores change their policies to try and combat a lot of this fraud the fraudsters just get smarter and yeah. change up what they're doing and find uh, other loopholes uh, you know so as far as today versus back then uh it, i think in 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 if i quantify it in level of difficulty i think it would be a lot more difficult now um to do it uh what was there? there's two parts to that question right yeah um, the other one was the, oh, uh, with technology oh. always changing. I'm sure it was a full time job. Yeah, I you mean, answered that. Yeah, well, that's you pretty answered much that. answered that. Um, what about the also in your day to day life? Car. How stressful was your day? For me, I wasn't stressed at all, man. You know, I didn't. I, it wasn't like I was a dope dealer and I always had guns and drugs on me. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I, you know, because what I was doing is I had it so compartmentalized from my normal life. When I left the house, there was no reason for me to be concerned about anything you know my plates and my insurance are good i don't have warrants out for my arrest there is no there's no manhunt going on for me i'm not you know i'm not i'm on the most wanted list yet or a criminal so i you know in my day-to-day -day, i didn't care and, you know and and to be honest with you every time i see police i'd be relieved you know especially if i was in a bad neighborhood all right <laughs> So, I was gonna say I, I've got like I got tickets all the time in different people's I like I actually yeah. I didn't leave as you know as Matt Cox like if I was on the run I was living as other people but I have a I have a driver's license issued by the local DMV mm -hmm. with my picture on it yeah you know I have a passport if I have a pa if I need a passport I would have a passport I have credit cards in this person's name bank accounts I'm driving a vehicle in his name mm -hmm. you know and this is some guy who's a homeless person five states away like he's never gonna cause any problems i mean i get pulled over i'm not concerned at all here's my id write me the ticket no problem i'll go to traffic school like i don't have a problem i wasn't worried when i was on the run i wasn't scared i wasn't riddled with anxiety mm -hmm. like like i even said and you know like honestly being on the run was probably one of the best times of my life like same yeah so fun. i i wasn't con you know i wasn't concerned about it it's like you're a secret agent it's exactly <laughs> it was, it was felt great and as far as doing my scam i think doing my scam now Parts of my scam I wouldn't attempt to do, and there are other, but there are other real estate scams that I was doing that are easier to do now than they ever were before. Like now, you can do everything online. Used to be, I had to go down to public records, put your face on it. You have to go in the bank to open the bank account. You have to go do this. You have to do that. You could, you had to go. You want to get cash out of the bank? Like you could wire money into different bank accounts, but at some point. 
unless you're going to go to an ATM at some point or buy gold or something like that, mm-hmm. you're going to have to go in and get cash. You know, or you could you could buy gold, you could buy things, but then it's just more problem. Now I got to try and sell it. Now I got to. But now you know, you could. There's all kinds of ways to to move money that there just weren't available, and they're less likely to catch the fraud because I'm not stealing money from somebody's bank account. I'm refinancing a house five times, putting the money in the bank, and the money's really there. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm using credit cards, the credit cards are really mine. They're granted they're in a homeless person's name, but he doesn't know, and he's not going to find out, and he's not going to raise any, any a stink. So, you know, yeah, I mean, there there is in a lot of ways what I was doing is much easier now than it ever was before. Right. Yeah, which is is horrible for me. Yeah, because I leave the house, and anytime I'm broke or uh, my bills are coming due, and I'm like, fuck, but now I need, I, how am I going to come with this money or whatever? Mm-hmm. Like, trust me, my first thought. Go straight to fraud. Just go for another run, baby. Right. And, you know, I have to sit there and go, geez, you know, there's that house over there. <laughs> Nobody lives there. Like, I could I could go downtown and transfer the warranty deed, or I could even put that house up for sale. I could go, you know, like, I could, I could get a, a get an appraisal on it, or I could transfer it into somebody else's name and go online and have somebody in California buy the house, you know, and do the closing and everything, you know, online and Oh, with the way that people are buying houses now, sight unseen, sight paying up. cash. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Satisfy the loan on the house, transfer yeah. it into my so they in, just into wire me uh no go problem. Ahead and wire me the closing and listen, there's there's so I'll many, get the title sent out to you. There's so many real estate clubs. You, you could meet somebody at a real estate I could go to a real estate club, hang out for go two or three times, meet a couple of guys, tell them I flip houses, and I know enough. Listen, I can convince anybody I flipped a hunt over God, I've flipped hunt, Probably, well, about a, over 150 houses. Mm. So I could go in, convince some guy that I have an in with some bank or some real estate trust, but I can't put the house in my name. Can I transfer the title into your name and we'll put it up for sale and sell it and then we'll split the money, but you got to give me the money in cash. And you take on the, the, uh, all the IRS responsibility. Most guys in a real estate trust or uh, real estate um, investment club would go, hell yeah. So you're saying you got a guy at the bank that... He's going to basically give you the property and we're going to sell it. And I just put it in mind. Yeah, I have no problem. I'll give you the money in cash. So we're going to make what? 100, 150. I'll give you 75,000 in cash. Take a couple of days. Yeah, no problem. Because, you know, I owe the IRS. Like I could <laughs> easily set that up. And so, you, the guy would totally believe me. Susie did one. He'd be ready to do three more. Listen, four months later, when it all catches up to him and I'm gone, and I've got my half a million dollars in cash. He's got some major problems. <laughs> but the truth is, what have I done? Even if he picked me out of a lineup, he gave me all cash. I'd be like, I don't know this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where did I meet him? Yeah. I've never been there. Like, I mean, there's so many ways to do real estate t- state fraud. And that and that's like a low budget. Like, I can think of 10 different ways I could do it where I never touched it. I never did anything. What are you t- this, well, you just hand me over cash. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a better person now. And, you know. Yeah, Jess said. Jess said I can't do that anymore. Yeah. The judge made it very clear that's Absolutely. unacceptable yeah. behavior. Yeah, I think that would also be uh, in violation of your federal probation. Probation as well. officer's not going to be they okay with it. Any crimes? Absolutely not. She's not going to be okay with it. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. Uh, this is from Lying Dog Faced Pony Soldier. Nice. Quite nice. quite the mouthful. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think about the future of crypto and NFTs and the potential for high-level frauding, scamming with big celebrities and athletes doing it? How can we avoid being crypto scammed, or is it always going to be a thing? Well, unfortunately, lying dog-faced pony soldier, this is always going to be a thing. Uh, as yeah, long as there's millions of dollars involved, there will always be somebody trying to steal it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and as, as far as the future of crypto and NFTs... Uh, I mean, listen, you know, the, the society that we live in, I think, will eventually all be blockchain. Uh, all of our money is going digital. You know, it's gonna, they're going to move away from paper currency, uh, ho- you know, hopefully within the next 10, 20, 50 years. Everything's going digital. I love the chip thing where we were talking about the chip thing. And you were like, I'm the first one getting chip. Neuralink. Neuralink. I'll be the first one in line. Let's do it. If it, listen, if it makes my life more convenient, I'm all for it. You know what I mean? If there's proven, you know, medical... Uh, science behind you know what's being introduced into the public, then I'm I'm all I'm all for it. Put a chip in my hand, stick one up my ass. I don't give a fuck. Let's do it. If it can open my car and let me fucking flip the channels on the television, let's do it. Make sure to put that in the in the tags, Colby. Chip in my ass. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I mean, I know you you're not really you don't really know too much about the crypto I, I or NFT market. You're just I think you I think you're just now starting to understand what all of it is. No, really. I, and I'm starting to understand it. But my whole thing is, is like you know to me, like I was talking, I told you I was talking to Jess where she was like, you know, they could read your mind. They could you know she was like getting you know, like they want to put this like I would never and I and I'm like eh and she's like what and I said listen, thirty years ago you would think. I'm not gonna carry around a cell phone. Like they can leave a message. I'll call yeah, them back. I need and a telephone in my telephone pocket. Telephone in my pocket. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm never yeah. gonna need that. Like I can't imagine life without my iPhone now. Yeah. And maybe that's pathetic. But well, this is the world that we live in. It's now. just so. It's to me. It's convenience. Yeah. It's just convenience. You know, I haven't used my debit card in months or cash. All I use is my oh, fucking yeah, Apple my, Pay. my Apple Pay. Yeah. I mean, listen. I was at the DMV. Bing. I went to the fucking got me a chicken sandwich today. She fucking held the thing out the window. I just held my phone out. Bing. Well, I might pull right up to the gas pump. Bing. You just hold your phone up to the gas pump. Like, you, you never need to carry cash or a credit card or anything ever again. It's all, it's all fucking right here. So, listen, Colby. So, when we were in prison and I was writing the memoir, we were writing out his outline. Um, he was talking about, like, you know, this, this. And I said, so, did you have an iPhone? He was disgusted immediately <laughs> that I said it. And I went, what? And, he, and I go, what? He said, I would never. I will never get an iPhone. I will never buy any Apple products at all. Let me tell you something. They have a closed, and he went into this whole spiel about how oh, yeah, I had you this can't whole, yeah. I had get this a whole, whole thing down. I was like, what the I hell I had a speech that I rehearsed in, in a couple times, so that anytime somebody brought up fucking Apple, I was ready to unload on them, and it was just fucking perfectly fucking delivered and, and everything. He's, and then and now I, I only own Apple he's products. He's got all Apple products. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Apple Watch. I got the best iPad, the Pro. I, said, I got the 12 Pro Max phone. What happened? Fucking MacBook. I go, what happened to the thing? I don't know, man. I just um, got tired. You just, I just, you're, I'm fighting it. You guys wore, listen, I got wore down and I eventually fucking broke down and I bought, no, I think I bought an iPhone because of Clubhouse. Because the app, the Clubhouse, when Clubhouse was like, you know, real big and right. like the first month it was out or whatever, like. It's still pretty big, nah. right? Not really. No? Nah. Is it going I mean, down? I'm sure it is in, to I some s- people, but I mean, you know, not really. I don't really. You got burnt out. Yeah, I got burnt out on it. Um, you I was were doing, in it every I was doing day. it every night. I was hosting rooms, and I was going, and you know, I was doing other shit. But it was only available on the uh, App Store right? for Apple. So I was like, well, fuck it. I'll buy an iPhone so I can get on Clubhouse. And then that kind of sucked me into the ecosystem. And then, uh, you know, I'm a tattooer. So Procreate is pretty much uh, almost as important to tattooing now as the tattoo machine. Right. You know what I mean? Like, cause you know, and you can't use procreate on anything, but Apple, Apple product, Apple products. So I've always wanted to use procreate. And that was like one of, the, one of the, the allure of the Apple product for me was procreate. And then once I started playing on procreate, I'm like, Holy fucking shit, this is awesome. Right. And now I'm on it every day and I can't, I do everything on procreate. Like I wouldn't be able to tattoo if it was, I mean, I was honest, I'd be able to tattoo, but like, so say somebody comes in with a design that I can do on Procreate in five or ten minutes, whether it would take me like an hour or two to draw it before. And then if it was the wrong size or they didn't like something in it, guess what? Now i got to go back another 45 minutes and fucking change and, you know, erase and draw and, and redraw the whole thing. Yeah, he sees me on GIMP doing stuff. He goes, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, what dude, are you doing? you got to get an iPad, man. You would love Procreate. Yeah. You would fucking love it. Yeah, so, yeah, I was uh, I was one of those people. And now I drank the Kool-Aid and... I got the Apple Watch and everything else. So. It's all in. All in. Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier every single month, you get a different painting. And the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. Darren Brind. What is a reform you'd believe would truly benefit convicts and better preparation for return to society? That's funny. Je- uh, Jess and I have talked about this all the time. Yeah. You, you're you're absolutely. This is absolutely something you're not going to agree with. Um, but uh, I would say that, like, I would make it mandatory. F- first of all, I would. So there's a a drug program called RDAP, but really it's not about drugs. It's about behavior modification. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's about criminal thinking yeah. and criminal thinking errors and how people. Are, you know how criminals obviously have a there's there's an issue and there's a it's it's a very clear issue if you talk to psychiatrists and psychologists and stuff they're like no no there's criminal they have criminal thinking errors and the way they deal with with stress and the way they deal with um, just everyday problems so y- you can take this nine month program and it gives you a year off your off of your sentence right. in federal prison right. to me I'd make that two years and I would make 
everybody have to take a version of RDAP. You want to get, now if you got five years, you want to get two years off, you got to go through the program. Now people will fake their way through the program. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's a given, but the, the DTSs that run it and the, the, usually they have a, uh, somebody who's got like a, a doctor's degree who runs the program. They, they're pretty sharp. They, they can spot like they, after a couple of years, they've seen so many guys, like they can really, they do an amazing job. The chick that ran the one in, in, uh, in the low in uh, Coleman, uh, her name was uh, Dr. Smith, mm-hmm. super just brilliant chick. And I, and I actually wrote, and I wrote a book called The Program, um, which is just like 100 pages, 110 pages. And it's about me going through the program, right? Mm-hmm. So I, like I told you last night, like I went through it twice. Yeah. I never finished it because I had an ulterior motive. But the point is, is that I think everybody could, should go because I think you learn so much about yourself and about the errors in your your thinking and, and what you've done wrong. And it's really it feels like brainwashing. And I, I make a lot of jokes about brain them brainwashing you. But it's really not because you can clearly see like this is how I want to respond. But it makes you think about all of the ramifications and how you probably would be better off doing this than doing this, even though everything in me says act this way. And you they they have they train you to do that instantly it has cut recidivism rate for people that go through that program by half it's an amazing um it's an amazing program but also because it's voluntary program so people going into that program have probably already made the decision that they want to either change right. well, they, and they also want to get the or year they want off. the year off and then they go in and they're like they're more susceptible and open to fucking suggestion you know so I, I agree, but I also agree with this. A lot of knuckleheads are going to go in there and be like, fuck this. Right. Well, some people just quit. Stick me in the shoe. I don't care. Right. Some people just say, I'm done. They they, they won't go through it. They won't do it. My point is this, is that, look, sometimes if you pretend, even if it starts off as pretending, you pretend to, let's say, like a product. Yeah. I'm going to tell everybody how much I like. I don't really like this thing. It sucks, but I'm going to tell everybody. You You start convincing yourself eventually that it is a good product mm. and you start to find good things about the product. And before you know it, you'll have a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times you'll convince yourself that, you know what? It is a good product. Like I didn't see it at first. And there's a lot of people that fake their way through the program. But by the end of the program, they're actually like, man, I've learned a lot. Like I know a lot now and I feel different. And I really, really like there were guys by the end of the program who were talking to their, their spouses or I'll give you an example, Kayla, my ex-wife. By the end of the program, the first time I took it, when I would call her, and we weren't married. She's married to somebody else, but she would come see me, and we were still, you were friends. You heard me talking to her. Mm-hmm. She still calls. Um, we're still friends. So, But I would call her. You know, you call home, and even though I didn't have a lot of people at home, I would call people. You call your mom. You call some buddies, and I would call my ex-wife, check on my son, see how she's doing. Just, But typically, when you talk to me on the phone, and even today, Colby, I'm sure, can attest to this. You can attest to this, that... Most of the time when we have a conversation, somehow or another, mm-hmm. I turn that conversation into being something about me. Right. Right. So I'm just, I'm a narcissist. That's so what you I, do. I, that's what I do. Yeah. And I semi noticed it before, but going through that program, I not only realized how much of an issue it is, but how detrimental it is to all my relationships and how uncomfortable it is for someone having to deal with me. Mm-hmm. Like being a friend of mine or in my world, there's no real benefit to you. <laughs> you know, it's all about me. Yeah. I don't really, I, I have a hard time caring about you. Yeah. Um, and I can see that and understand it. And a lot of times I try and focus on it, even when I can't, I'll go into conversations and have a conversation and, and really focus on trying to ask the other person about them and themselves and their lives and, mm-hmm. and try and understand what's going on with them and try and rem- even remembering about that person. So my ex-wife, I remember one time I called her when I was in the program, I called her up. Hey, what's going on? How's it going? And I'd say about five minutes in the end of the conversation, she goes, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and I go, what? She said, all you've done is ask me uh, about Nick, which is her, her husband, and how your mo- my mom's doing. You've asked me about the kids. You've asked me about this. What's going on with this? She goes, we've spent, it was probably 10 minutes into the conversation. She goes, we spent the last 10 minutes talking about me. I go, what's wrong with that? She said, that's not something you do. Mm-hmm. You don't care about anybody but you. Yeah. She goes, what's happening? And I went, no, we'll see. I'm taking this program. And I kind of explained the whole mm-hmm. thing. I was like, but I didn't even realize I was doing it. 
like I was starting to force myself, but it, it was no longer being forced where I started talking to other people and trying to understand what was going on in their head. And so I felt like it really changed. Now, I think I reverted almost completely back to who I am, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but at least it was something that I knew about myself and it helped me have a better connection with people and realize how horrible it is to probably try and be a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. It's just such a one-sided fucking relationship. So I think that's, I think it's great. I think it's a great program. I think you can fake yourself into it and still end up getting a major, maybe turn your life around some now. People. Some people. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a hard case. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that some people are just, they're not capable of, of kind of, you know. Change. Yeah, or even abstract thought for that matter. To even, you know, step outside of themselves and then, you know, look and inflect on their own behavior and, you know, their own, you know, the psychology behind why they think the way they do. I don't, I think some people are just literally incapable of doing that. Right. But it doesn't mean that you don't still make an attempt. Obviously. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. so let's say it's 10% or 5%. Those, some That's just, just my don't. asshole opinion. Right. Well, I think also, I think that the, the other thing about incarceration is that the sentences are just draconian. They're just, they're just massive and there's no, there, well, that's what they do. They just wear you down with yeah. time. Cause then that's the only thing they can do is just wear you down. Yeah. By the time you're, you get out, you're so fucking old. Just, you can't even commit a you crime. You see anymore. those guys, like yeah. for the guys that do a lot of time. Like I oh. was in, I was, I've been in the halfway house. A lot of those guys, or I was even, you know, in prison with those guys. But after you see them when they get out, uh, they're just, they have a look in their eyes. They're just, they're never the same again. Yeah, if, you, if the guys that do dead. 20, 20 years, they're just, their eyeball, you can look in their eyeballs and tell they're fucking, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah, they're not coming back. Um, well, well, I think the problem is, is that there's really no programs. That, well, there, I'm not saying there's no programs. There are programs. There are not as many programs out there as there should be to help people get back on their feet. So, for so for instance, when I got out of prison and when I went to halfway house, I didn't have anybody. Right. I didn't have no family that was willing to help me out or lend me any money or do anything for me. So when I got a halfway house. I'm sure when you got out, they gave you a check for no, a, a I, grand or something. I got no. nothing when I got yeah, out. I know. Nothing. Zero. I got zero dollars. They people, gave me. People a, think they give you money. People no. think, oh, they gave you a check for like $1,000, no. right, to help no. get you started. Nope. I got a bus ticket to the halfway house. Yeah. From but when you got the halfway house, they must have had clothes waiting for you nothing, and nothing. Nothing. I had basically whatever I could bring with me from prison. So I had prison sweats. I had prison shorts, prison T-shirts, prison Nikes, and prison socks. And that was it when I got to Halfway House. So when I got to Halfway House, I had six months to try and fake and figure out how to make enough money to get an apartment when I got out of Halfway House to find to, to pay for somewhere to live. Yeah. And that's it. And like they'll give you a they'll, they'll give you a, a voucher for a bus pass at the Halfway House, and then they cook you meals at the Halfway House. So you have to eat at the, all your meals at the Halfway House if you can't afford yeah. anywhere else. And if you have to eat at lunch, eat lunch at your work, they give you a bag lunch. Yeah, like you know, an apple and a sandwich, and maybe a banana and some crackers. Yeah. And you, you, you'd better be okay with eating bologna or peanut yeah. butter and jelly. Yeah. So you know, <clears throat> there was nothing for me when I got out. There was yeah. no program to where I could go down and sit with a counselor and, and okay, okay, what do you need right now to be successful in society? Okay, let's fucking get you a, a, a rent stipend. Let's get you a, you know, a fucking transportation stipend. Let's get you hooked up with like an employment center to find you, you know, how, you know, employment. Here's housing set up to where, you know, you can go over here and apply for housing. There was none of that. Right. I was set up to fail from fucking day one when I walked out. Yeah, that's how I felt. You know, so no wonder I, I, six months out of halfway house, I was already printing credit cards again. Right. And I went straight back to prison. Right. You know what I mean? Because yeah, so like I said, there was just nothing. So yeah, I feel, I, I definitely feel like there needs to be some kind of network set up. I, I don't think not so much before you get out. I mean, yeah, because there's just plenty of programs and shit you can do in prison. If you really want to fucking change and rehabilitate yourself, you can. It's it's for, for me. It's more of a concern. It's the after you get yeah, out. That's what I. That's mean. where there's no programs or anything set up for anybody. Right. Like you're just you're fucked. Like if you get out and you don't have anywhere to live, you're you're literally sleeping on the sidewalk. Right. Or you're or you or you're probably if you're on Lord you know, God forbid you're on paper, they're gonna make you go to a homeless shelter. Yeah. And you have to be at that homeless. So it's like the whole fucking dude. It's like what? You, you yeah, know you what I mean? Put me in an environment where yeah, I gotta. Dude, I'm already right. going back into a bunch of right. fucking bullshit. Right. You know what I mean? Like so, I feel like when you get out of prison after you've served your time, there needs to be some kind of program set up to give you a fresh start a place to live a job you know what i mean like all that stuff needs to be provided for you or there need to be some kind of program set up to where you can enroll and well so let me, let me play devil's advocate here, have those needs met here, here's here's what people are thinking and this is where people think where i think their thinking is incorrect most people will say 
You're a fucking criminal. You committed crime. You got out of prison. Society doesn't know you shit. Fuck you. Figure it out. Right. Now, here's the problem with that. And I get that because I'm actually, that's actually how I feel. <laughs> Deep down, I feel like, you know, fuck you. You were, you fucked up. I, you shouldn't be given anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, now let's be logical. Let's think logically. The truth of the matter is you just stuck me back in an environment where my go-to move is commit a crime. So if you, even if you think, fuck you, you don't deserve shit, well, then let's just go and let's think about society for a second here and why the recidivism rate in this country is through the fucking roof. As it's, well as the crime rate. Absolutely. Because there are no programs to help you or help me. And if I can't figure it out or if I don't have friends and family to help no resources. me, most people only get back on their feet because they have friends and family willing yep. to help. A but grandmother it, or right. a fucking – But yeah. if you did 15 years or 13 years, who helps you? Yeah. Who helps you? Nobody. Nobody. So you're either going to – you either have to have everything go right and get yourself back on your feet, which anything goes wrong. You're gonna fuck. You're going under. You're most likely you're gonna turn to fraud, or you're gonna crime, or rob a bank, or do something. You're gonna come in their crime. So, if for no other reason to stop this recidivism rate, to keep to keep the cost down on prisons, if you gave people a, people programs mm-hmm. to get them a decent job and get themselves back on their feet, then you lower the recidivism rate dramatically. Yeah. And you and so even if you think fuck these guys getting out of prison. Okay, well, if you had helped, if you helped them a little bit, they would get back on their feet and they could re-enter society. They could start paying taxes. You know, it's funny because the um, so it costs about thirty-two thousand dollars a year to to house a federal inmate. It's something like seventeen in the state. So look at it like this. Let's say it's thirty thousand dollars. Let's say round down. People are, oh, thirty thousand dollars to to house an inmate. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the problem. It's really fifty-two thousand. Because what you're not taking into account is while he's incarcerated, he's not paying into Social Security. He's not paying – and this is all just average. The, it, and not paying Social Security, not paying taxes mm-hmm. on, on uh, uh, county taxes, not paying into um, income tax. He's not, like, there's, uh, he's not buying consumer goods, mm-hmm. which also helps contribute to society. Like, yeah. You add it all up. It actually – the Census Bureau came up with a figure of oh, – it's like slightly over. It's like 52 yeah. and change. Not that they 52. were paying into Social Security or taxes before. Right. Well, <laughs> I'm saying – you're Most of those guys. Well, okay, yeah, if they're criminals. But if you got them out back into society right. no, in yeah. a regular job. Yeah, I was making a joke. Yeah. In a regular job, though, that's what they're contributing. So that's what you're yeah. costing yeah. thirty thousand for this, and the lack of twenty thousand and something. So I mean, those programs pay for themselves in the long run. So there should be something. And I'm not, I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm get on, fucking pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm as yeah. hard of an asshole as anybody. But yeah, it just I doesn't think, make sense. Yeah, I think there needs to be some kind of like I would like to start like a, maybe like a nonprofit and uh, you know buy up a bunch of real estate for inmates to live in when they get out and they just pay like a you know make it like an income based kind of thing where like you know yeah, as you, they get more they yeah. pay more and then eventually transition them yeah. out to and, and make it you know you can only stay here for 12 months or whatever like right. you know and then you have to fucking make room for other people that need the fucking space so you got now you have a year and you're basically paying us fucking 80 dollars a month for rent if you can't get your shit together in that year yeah well you were going back no matter what yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so so yeah i i i, I hear you I say we get them in there and we 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 pay them low wages and we'll have them work in a factory and some sweat like like. like well, we could provide housing and you know um, make slave some labor. money off these yeah, guys like really Unicor. Fucking, yeah, Unicor. God, what a racket that is, yeah. bro. But yeah, oh, I know. Trust me. Um. Yeah, I think that's the end of the questions. Actually, I think we answered them all. Really? Yep. Oh, I thought you were on the. I was. I was looking. No. And I was thinking. God, is he still on the first page? No, we hit them all. Nice. Hey, I appreciate you watching. And if you like the video, do me a favor and subscribe. Hit the bell so you get notifications about videos like this. Leave me a comment in the comment section. I try and respond to as many of the comments as possible. Unless they're just ridiculous. And uh, share the video with any of your friends and family. And uh, I appreciate it. And make sure you watch all the commercials. See ya.